But welcome to Virtual Adventure Cafe, everyone. I want to welcome you to our, to our annual BioConnect conference and a special welcome to our first time community members. Uh, before I hand the session over to our presenters, I want to remind anyone who is um, not on mute to mute themselves. And if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen and our presenters will get to them as they can. So I want to give a special shout out and thanks to CBiz, one of our annual sponsors at Venture Cafe that enable us to bring this uh, content to the community to um, expand entrepreneurship in the region. Uh, before we get into today's uh, presentation, I want to introduce Dave Lewin and Michael Carenti. Dave is a leader of the accounting advisory practice in New England. With more than 20 years of experience in financial leadership roles, Dave and his team are well positioned to assist clients with financial statement preparations, interpretation, and implementation with everything from accounting standards to IPO readiness and support. Joining my, uh, Dave is Michael Carenti. He is the leader of the Boston Tax Group and the Life Sciences Practice in New England. Uh, he has more than 25 years of experience serving publicly traded and privately held clients in the life sciences, tech, and manufacturing industries. Michael uh, has assisted many companies in developing and implementing proactive federal, state, and international tax plans to minimize tax liability. So if there's anybody that you want to ask these questions, these are your people. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you guys. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to having a great uh, seminar. Uh, and I just wanted to introduce myself. Sean did a great job. I am Michael Currenti, the tax practice leader here for CBiz in Boston. Um, as Sean said, I uh, spend most of my time with life science and technology companies, helping them implement tax strategies. Uh, part of the things that we're going to be talking about today is how to save cash and also minimize taxes um, during a COVID situation. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dave Lewin. It's a pleasure to meet everybody virtually. Um, as introduced, I'm the leader of the accounting advisory practice here at CBiz New England. And uh, in short, we help companies with anything and everything that would flow through a traditional controller's uh, department and organization. And by way of background, I spent 10 years uh, as an auditor and then spent 10 years out in industry as a controller for Duncan Brands, Orchard Brands, and Welch's before joining CBiz. So I typically bring the audit background as well as a real life controllership background to the table. So we hope you enjoy the presentation today and feel free to ask any questions as we move on or save them to the end, either way. Next slide, please. So my presentation is gonna cover a number of things that small biotechs and small startups really need to think about as they're just getting off the ground. Because there's a lot of things that can be done upfront that aren't very costly, but can, can really save companies time and effort down the road, um, you know, as they grow, as they raise capital, and as well as coming down to the end of the year when you got to file tax returns, issue 1099s, there's a whole bunch of things that can be done upfront that really make those processes easier. So most, if not all startups, um, are gonna need to pay basic operational expenses when they're just getting off the ground. Many don't have full-time employees, many use lots of 1099 type of consultants. So you wanna make sure as you're getting off the ground and you're engaging these different individuals or organizations to help you, that you're collecting W-9s, and then to the extent that you're paying international vendors, you're getting your W-8s and your W-8 Bennies. Um, and those really come in, come in handy. So at year end, when you're legally required to issue 1099s to US um, individuals, or um, you're making, again, payments internationally, you can get really hung up on the tax side from international payments if you don't have these W-8s, because you could be on the hook for any withholding tax that you may have neglected to withhold. Um, so just a couple of important steps there. And then when you think about your general accounts payable process, you want to make sure you have a central place for vendors to send their invoices. So many of our, you know, kind of new clients that we get, they vendors kind of go to the different individual employees and they're not really centralized. So it can make keeping it, it can make the, the tracking and payment of your vendors on a timely basis difficult. So you want to set up a good process for that. The other thing we recommend is get your vendors to accept electronic payment. Checks can be, 
you know, timely, costly, more difficult, especially in today's environment where all of a sudden everybody's working from home. The, the, uh, the stash of checks are in the office. So if you've got your, your vendors up to receive electronic payment, it can be very, it can be much more effective and efficient. And lastly, you definitely want to, uh, to create a good formal process for invoice approval, um, especially in you know, the, the early stages of companies, every dime counts. So you want to make sure money leaving your organization is approved by the right level of individual. I get asked a lot, you know, what accounting system should I use? Do I need NetSuite? Do I need Oracle, et cetera, et cetera. Most small startups are, are completely fine using QuickBooks um, or QuickBooks Online for, for their bookkeeping. And believe it or not, a handful of publicly traded biotechs are still on QuickBooks. Now, by the time comp companies decide to go public, if they go public, our recommendation is actually they move off it but there are plenty of, of publicly traded small biotechs that are actually still on QuickBooks. And one other system that a lot of our small companies use is, is, is a company called bill.com. And we find that it makes the invoice payment process really efficient, much easier. Um, and there are just a whole bunch of enhancements that, that they can offer that make the process, again, much easier. Um, when you think about closing your books, get in the habit early of doing monthly closes. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be, you know, super tight, but, but getting in that routine of closing down your books monthly, looking at the results of operations in your balance sheet will really help you um, in the long run and set the stage for a well-controlled environment. And then two more items here. You know, we recommend doing companies at a young stage, like do a basic gap income statement, balance sheet and a statement of cash flows. So, you know, at the end of the day, what does that mean? That means doing a good accrual cutoff, um, thinking about those potential complex accounting areas that a lot, and we'll get into some of those in a moment, that a lot of companies wait two, three years to start doing, and then they've got to go back and restate their internal books and records to be in compliance with gap. But, but, but getting in that habit is really good. And then lastly, you know, working with your accounting advisors to create a good set of accounting policies as well as internal controls. Because again, you'll be setting the stage um, as your company grows to be able to issue um, you know, gap compliant financial statements to have good internal controls. And again, when you're looking to raise capital, people that are investing in you wanna know that there's good internal controls in your finance organization. So next slide, please. So I'm going to go through a handful of things that, that we see a lot of small biotechs um, kind of wait a little bit too long to start addressing. So we want to just bring some of these items to your attention, as well as um, some things to be aware of. So as your organization, if your organization, for example, is, is raising uh, capital and it's going to be through convertible preferred stock, there are some things to think about when your lawyers are, are, are drafting those agreements because they never think of the accounts. They just, they just think, of, think of themselves. So um, the accounting for stock options in restricted stock. So most, most small biotechs at some point start issuing either restricted stock or stock options. And the accounting for these can get a little tricky, but a couple of the high level things you wanna, you wanna be cognizant of is stock options can either be incentive stock options with, which come with some tax benefits for the holders as well as a bunch of rules. And then there's non-qualified stock options which is typically what you see to your general employee population. Um, so with those, you wanna get a, a valuation of your company, company stock. Because as you issue stock options, you're gonna, you're gonna uh, assign a, a strike price if you will. And you want that strike price to be worth what the or to equal um, what, the, what the stock is currently valued at. And that's really important down the road if you ever decide to go public, because the SEC and the auditors will look at that. And if you actually um, you know, priced your stock options at a lower value than the, than, the, than the fair value of the share at the time, you could have some cheap stock issues. So it's something you definitely want to look at. Secondly, from a payroll tax perspective, 
when um, you issue non-qualified stock options, again, these are options that go to your general employee population. As those options vest, there is no tax consequence, but the moment an employee exercises their option, you're going to need to withhold employer taxes and the employee is going to need to pay uh, his or her share of employee taxes. So just something to be aware of. And then the ISOs, as long as you do it right, those defer uh, income tax treatment um, very favorably, if you will, to a non-qualified stock option. And then lastly, in this category, if you're issuing restricted stock, so that's when you issue a share of stock that is not subject to an option price, like a stock option, invests over time, employees have the election of, of, of doing what you call an 83B election. So they can pay ordinary income tax on the fair value of that stock on the date of grant, or if they don't make that election, they pay ordinary income tax as that stock option vests over time. So, de so depending on the employee, that could have a material impact, or the recipient of the award, that could have a material impact on their taxes and something definitely to think about, because you can only make that election um, when the stock is initially granted. So the next is convertible preferred stock. So virtually all of my small biotech companies as they go through their series A, series B, and so on, they issue convertible preferred stock. And the accounting for this can be super, super complex or easy depending on, on the uh, specific terms in the stock agreements. So we just wanna make you aware that within these agreements, we highly, highly suggest having a qualified CPA take a look at those draft agreements before they're issued. So at least you're aware of any potential uh, embedded derivatives, such as um, you know, tranche rights or anything else, where the, where the accounting gets really, really complex. And there are times when just a, a few tweaks of wording in the agreement can um, avoid all of that technical accounting that you'll ultimately, or most companies ultimately have to pay consultants to figure out. So there just can be some really complex accounting in there. So we just wanna make you aware, again, to think about these things and, and have some folks take a peek at it. Um, other items that we see a lot on the complex side are warrants. And typically warrants are valued very similar to uh, a stock option. Um, and then oftentimes uh, convertible debt is issued prior to a uh, preferred stock round. And believe it or not, the convertible debt accounting can, be, can, can often be more complex than the, than the preferred stock accounting. So again, having somebody really look at those agreements up front so that you're aware of the accounting consequences is important. And lastly, we also advise not waiting too long to do the accounting. So a lot of companies you know, who, who aren't subject to an audit they put the technical accounting on the, on the bookshelf for these items. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're going through their A round or their B round or their C round and they have to have an audit performed. And now they're going back two, three, four years to figure out what the accounting should have been on these things, you know, and then rolling it forward. So they create a lot of work in a very short period of time. So getting the accounting done for that stuff early, um, um, you know, is, is highly, highly recommended. Uh, next, and, and lastly, sorry, the last bullet on this slide is just a reminder, as you're, as you're granting stock options, you should, you should highly consider getting a valuation report, again, so that you know that you're granting the shares or the stock options at a price that won't trigger potential tax issues or SEC issues down the road. Next slide, please. So just a few other um, hot topics, if you will, that, are, that we see clients dealing with. So the first is lease accounting. Um, and the FASBs actually recently, just recently pushed off um, major, major changes to the lease accounting. But um, some of the benefits, I'm, I don't know if anybody, I'm, I'm assuming some folks on the line have leases at the CIC. The nice thing is that the way the CIC um, structures their leases, you can actually get around the, the technical lease accounting because they're more month to month service contracts. So that's actually a huge benefit uh, from an accounting perspective anyways. But um, the, the, the leases that we see for a lot of our biotechs, biotech startups 
um, are quite complex because they're typically, they typically include labs, lab build outs, and oftentimes the landlord is paying for a portion of the build out, our clients are paying portions of the build out, and depending on um, the terms of the lease, who's paying what portions of the build out, and a number of other potential factors, the accounting for these leases can get extremely complex. Um, so again, looking at those leases up front, not waiting too long to get the accounting right is, you know, is very prudent. And then there's this new concept out there of embedded leases. So that's where you have a service contract where within the service, you might have access or use to a particular asset. And the new lease accounting rules are, require you to dig in and figure out if you actually have essentially an embedded lease within a service contract. And we don't see too many of them in the biotech space, but, but there are cases where there's lab equipment buried into a service contract where you actually have to bifurcate it. Um, and account for the leases that way. Uh, next thing are collaboration agreements. So lots of um, biotech companies have collaboration agreements with either big pharma or, or other companies. And, and in some cases, these collaboration agreements are relatively simple, but in other cases, they may um, include a like milestone type payments if certain milestones are made, they may include a future license agreement or royalty agreement if a product is eventually um, approved, let's say by the FDA and then, and then subsequently commercialized. So the accounting for these agreements can be very, very complex in terms of when expenses are recognized. Are they recognized over time? Are they recognized up front? Uh, and same with the revenue. Um, the, new, the new revenue recognition standard, unlike the old, um, requires companies that have these agreements to make a determination if these milestone payments in the future are going to be met and, and earlier recognition prior to the cash being received is sometimes the right answer. So these can be very complex um, and um, you know you want to make sure the accounting for these is right, especially when you're gearing up for your first audit or a potential um, capital raise. Next slide, please. So when we think about as the, as, as your companies grow and you think about, um, fundraising, um, oftentimes as soon as you do that, that series a, your, your new private equity or venture capital owners will require you to go out and get an audit. So again, echoing what I said, all the things that I've talked about, you want to put yourself in the best possible position so that when you have to do that audit, number one, you're not going back and, and, and updating and restating your, your, your prior issued financial statements, um, as well as just being able to make it through that first audit with the least amount of pain possible because they're not fun, um, but they're a necessary evil. And, and 99 times out of 100, as soon as you have that series A, you're gonna be required to, to get an audit done. Um, so potential ex exit strategies. Um, so obviously if you're gonna do an IPO, multiple years of, of gap financial reporting are gonna be required and quarterly financial re uh, reporting is also gonna be required when you file your S1 and then subsequent quarterly reporting. So thinking ahead as to when you think you may want to IPO, if that's the exit route, you really want to start to be cognizant regarding quarterly cutoff, quarterly financial statements, um, and certain accounting rules that are only applicable to public companies um, and not private. Now, most, again, most of our small biotechs, there are rules are out there issued by the SEC that allow smaller, um, smaller companies to continue to follow the private company adoption timeline. But that can change overnight if you have a huge IPO and your market cap you know, exceeds the limit that would trigger you into a large accelerated filing. Um, having good gap financial statements is also very beneficial from a strategic acquisition. So oftentimes, you know, if companies are looking to acquire you, they want to know that they can acquire you and then integrate your accounting into theirs. So having, again, good solid gap financial statements 
uh, makes that process better, and it also makes the organization um, a, a more appetizing target, if you will, um, for acquisition. And obviously, any of these exit strategies is going to put a significant stress on human capital, because you know, oftentimes you're working on, you know, decks and, and, and information requests, due diligence requests. So you know, again, having having your accounting done right makes that process a lot easier. Next slide, please. So, you know, when you're thinking about what should I be doing um, myself, what should I be potentially outsourcing, and who would I outsource that to, there's clearly a lot of, of options out in the market today. Um, there are, you know, independent contractors who do work like this. There are very expensive, lar the large big four firms who do this. And then there are firms like CBiz, and we offer, you know, a really unique offering in that we've got folks who have worked in the seats of the controllers as well as, um, you know, the, the the former auditors and people like myself who have done both. So we understand what you need. We understand what the company needs. We understand, um, you know, what um, what 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 the potential buyers, if you will are gonna need. So we come in and, and we offer a really, really hands-on approach. And we tailor that approach to the level that our companies need it. So we're constantly providing you with information around, these are things to think about for the next three months, six months, and a year. And these are the things we need to do right now to put yourself in the best position. Um, so, you know, and the other thing that companies like small biotechs, right, in the beginning, they don't have many employees and as they grow, they're gonna to start to hire more of a formal team. So what we typically do with our, with our clients is, once they start hiring for positions where we've been doing the work, we start to train those employees. We have the processes documented. So when new employees come in, it's not like they come in and they're not sure what to do. There's a nice roadmap um, and we're able to help transition those folks in. Next slide, please. Um, so lastly, you know, just to reiterate, uh, the CBIS accounting advisory team partners with tax, you know, and, and we like to be there every step of the way for, for our clients. So with our small biotech clients, we really grow with them the whole way. In the beginning, we're doing really easy stuff like processing accounts, payroll, accounts payable and payroll. And we grow with our clients all the way until they either have an exit strategy or they decide to go public. Um, we do the general accounting and reporting outsourcing. We assist on the technical account accounting side. And then again, you know, once, once you've figured out what your exit strategy is, we make sure that we um, help you through that entire process. So I hope that was beneficial. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask or we can keep them to the end. And then no, no formal questions came in on the chat, uh, but we'd ask our attendees if you have any questions, now would be a great time to ask them and we're here to help. Okay, so I'm gonna start in on the fun section now that Dave did his accounting piece, we're gonna talk tax, which is always the fun section, that's why we save it to the end. What we're going to talk about is ways to save some cash tax as well as minimize tax and some of the strategies that we've used with clients in the past. So if we can go to the next slide. So our agenda for today is talking about some of the components of the Tax Act that came through with the CARES Act that was passed on uh, March 27th. Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about, you know, through the CARES Act is net operating losses and how to utilize those and what benefits can be taken as a result of some of the CARES Act changes on net operating losses. Interest expense limitation deduction, again, something that came in through tax reform, how the CARES Act revised that so that we can take more benefits through that to create uh, more tax efficient uh, production. We're also gonna talk about the qualified improvement property depreciation, again, Tax reform came in, there was a glitch in tax reform relative to this component. CARES Act came in, cured that glitch, and now can allow us to do some tax planning to, again, provide you with some additional uh, cash tax dollar savings. Payroll tax deferral. 
CARES Act allows employers to defer payroll taxes. We'll talk about that and how that can save you cash, cash taxes now um, that you pay in the future. And then the employee retention credit. This is a refundable credit that again, can put cash in your pocket now. Next thing we're gonna talk about is accounting method checkup. Again, how can we minimize taxes going forward as well as currently? There's also something that we can talk about on accelerating 2020 disaster losses related to COVID-19 and taking that benefit on your 2019 return. Again, providing you with some cash taxes in your pocket now. Research and development tax credit for startups. This can be used. Most startup companies who are generating losses don't receive any benefit for the R&D credit currently, but there's a way to utilize that against payroll taxes. Again, saving you cash taxes currently and then minimizing the Massachusetts balance sheet tax. Most companies only think about the income tax related to them. And when you're losing money, there's usually no income tax, but Massachusetts not only taxes companies on their income, it also taxes them on their balance sheet. And that could be a pretty significant tax for companies like, you know, startup biotech companies or life science companies that are receiving, you know, funds from private equity firms or investment, uh, you know, investment capital firms um, and not knowing about this can be a big surprise at year end. Dave and I had a client earlier this year that Dave was doing the accounting for. We were not doing the tax and surprise came up to them when they were going to file their corporate return in September that they owed a significant amount of balance sheet tax. We were able to plan for them and reduce that tax down significantly um, and they then became a tax client. Next slide. So net operating losses and net operating loss carrybacks. Tax reform, which came into the law in 2018, did away with net operating loss carrybacks. What the CARES Act allowed companies to do, it allows you to carry back losses five years for losses that were generated in 2018, 2019, and 2020. This will provide you with a benefit, you know, to get some cash dollars back if you're having a down year because of COVID-19 or because of other reasons and carry back those losses in years that you may have been generating or reported income and paid taxes. The other benefit is through tax reform, the corporate tax rate was reduced to 21% in 2018. What the CARES Act allows you to do is not only carry those losses back five years, but it allows you to carry those losses back to years when the tax rate was 35%. So for a quick, easy example, if you generated a loss in 2018 or 2019 when the tax rate was 21%, that net operating loss is worth $21 to you. However, if you carry back the $100 to 2015, let's say, utilizing that loss will get you $35 of tax. So not only are you able to get some cash tax back, but you're also, because of the rate arbitrage, also able to get 14% more back than you would have if you utilized those losses, let's say in, in 2019. So again, very important, very good way to get some additional cash back, especially in a time of economic downturn. In addition, the CARES Act temporarily removed the 80% limitation on the utilization of NOLs. So if you generated an NOL in 2018, 2019, or 2020, and you can't carry it back, you can't currently use it, you're going to carry that forward. Under tax reform, when you carry that forward, you can only use 80% of those uh, losses against taxable income. Now you can use 100% of those losses. So again, easy example, if in 2022, you made $100 of income before the CARES Act came into being, if you carried it loss forward, you could only use $80 against the $100 of income, you'd end up with $20 of taxable income and you would pay a little over $4 of tax. CARES Act comes into place. What it allows you to do is carry those losses from 2018, 2019 and 2020 into 2022 and use 100% of that, thereby saving that $4 of tax. The, you know, what we've suggested and we're gonna talk about later in this presentation is what I call counterintuitive tax planning. Companies that are generating losses don't think about how to increase those losses, but because of the ability to carry those, forward, those losses forward without the 80% limitation, it may be quite powerful to be doing that so that when you do carry those forward, 
you can shelter 100% of the loss, 100% uh, of the income in years where you're making a lot of money. Next slide. The limitation on business interest. Again, tax reform limited the deduction on business interest to uh, interest income plus adjusted taxable income or 30% of adjusted taxable income. What the CARES Act allowed you to do is deduct business interest expense. It allowed you to deduct it up to business income, uh, in, I'm sorry, interest income plus 50% of adjusted taxable income. Why is that important? Because now you're allowed to deduct more of your business interest. And again, if that's gonna generate more losses as we just talked about, you can either carry back more of that to get money back or carry it forward and not have the 50 or the 80% haircut. In addition, the CARES Act, because of the economic mm -hmm. downturn expected in 2020, allows you to make an election to do the calculation based on 2019 adjusted taxable income when you would, you know, significantly have more taxable income in 2019 that you would be able to use to, to generate uh, more of an interest expense that you can either use in 2020 or you can uh, carry that forward or carry it back. Next slide. Expensing of qualified improvement property, otherwise known as the retail glitch. Again, when tax reform came into the law in 2018, there was an error in the drafting of the law which said any qualified improvement property was going to be depreciated over 39 years. So that was a you know, detriment for two reasons. One, you had 39 years that you were gonna have to depreciate it as opposed to 15 years. Secondly, you were not allowed to take bonus mm -hmm. depreciation. The CARES Act corrected that technical error. It now makes that 15 year property, which one, it makes it quicker to depreciate, but also again, makes it eligible for bonus depreciation. So in situations like this, where we talk about you know, how to generate more net operating losses in 2018, 2019, or 2020, because you could carry those losses back or carry those losses forward without any haircut. This allows you to do some additional tax planning by taking bonus depreciation in those years. In addition, as I mentioned, this glitch came into being in 2018. The CARES Act allows companies to go back to and immediately amend their 2018 return to take the benefit for this uh, bonus depreciation in, in order to get the benefit quicker. Next slide. Delay of payment of employer payroll taxes. So again, the CARES Act allows companies to de defer payroll taxes on the employer portion of the FICA piece. So the 6.2% payroll tax piece that the employer would normally pay from March 27th through the end of the year companies can defer 50% of their payroll taxes that would you know, can defer their payroll taxes on the FICA piece. 50% of it would be due on December 31st, 2021. And the other 50% would be due December 31st, 2022. Mm -hmm. So again, another way to put money in your pocket currently that you can use to fund operations and defer the payment of those taxes until future years. In addition, if you receive the payroll protection program loan, Recently, there's been a revision to that where companies who receive that payroll protection program loan can still defer taxes. So if you receive the loan, you got the loan money, you may be able to have that loan forgiven as well as take advantage of the deferral of the payroll taxes and not pay those taxes until 2021 and 2022. Next slide. The refundable uh, retention credit. So again, this is a refundable credit and it impacts companies in either of two situations. One, operations were fully or partially suspended due to shutdown or the government shutdown related to COVID-19, or your gross receipts were reduced by 50% or more because of COVID-15. There's a credit that's available. If you are an employer that has more than 100 full-time employees, the credit is available for wages paid to employees when they're not providing services. So you may have, people working remotely, but you may also have some people who are not able to work remotely. Those folks who are not able to work remotely, but you're still paying them, the, the amount that you're paying them is subject to ineligible for the credit. If you are a company that has fewer than 100 employees, then all employee wages are qualified for the credit. 
credit is on the first 10% of compensation paid to eligible employees. And you get, as I said, it's a 50% credit. So every employee that you've paid wages for could be eligible for $5,000 credit that you could put in your pocket now. Again, I would suggest, depending on who your payroll provider is, is to reach out to your payroll provider and to look at this as this could, again, save you money and it's also refundable. So it could currently put money in your pocket um, to help fund operations that may have been interrupted by COVID-19. Next slide. Accounting method checkup. So again, I call this counterintuitive tax planning in today's current environment. And the reason for that is companies generally, if you're a startup biotech company, you're generating losses because you probably don't have a, a compound or a drug that you're currently selling and you're not generating any revenue, you're generating losses because of the R&D function. But the reason, again, that you may want to accelerate those losses or accelerate the deductions and increase those losses is because of the ability to carry those forward without the 80% haircut that I originally talked about. Some things to look at and some things that we're advising our clients to look at is accelerating prepaid expenses. Under the tax law, you can make an election to accelerate prepaid expenses, and we've worked with a number of companies in order to do that so that they can accelerate their, law, uh, their deduction to increase their net operating loss that they could use to carry forward. We just talked about fixed assets and bonus depreciation on qualified improvement property, but there are other areas of fixed assets that we can elect bonus depreciation on. And again, we try to take a look at that in order to accelerate the deduction so that we can generate more of a net operating loss that we can use in the future at 100% as opposed to getting an 80% haircut if you were to take the depreciation in later years. Purchase discounts. If you're buying something and you're taking advantage of, you know, the rules that say, you know, 2% if you pay it within 10 days and you're taking that 2% discount, there's a counting method that can be elected that through your cost of goods sold calculation, you can actually you reduce your cost of goods sold, which would allow you to have more expenses and thereby reducing your taxable income. Something we've done for a lot of our manufacturing clients and a lot of our biotech clients who now have drugs that they are selling and have inventory. And the last thing is also inventory related, the inventory capitalization rules, taking advantage of those to increase deductions so that again, you can generate losses if you have income in, in earlier years that you can carry back or again, trying to carry those losses forward to future year. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this is something that I mentioned earlier, accelerating COVID-19 losses. So it's called the disaster losses provision. When pr the president enacted the Stafford Act on March 13th, that allowed this little known provision in the tax code to be triggered and allow companies to take a look at this. So what this code section 165I says is any losses incurred in a disaster area for 2020 can be used on your 2019 return, thereby taking advantage of those losses on your 19 return, which for most folks doesn't need to be filed until July 15th. So you can file that return on July 15th, taking the losses earlier and thereby getting additional money or again, increasing your net operating losses. One thing that I wanna point out is when this 165I was put into the tax code, it was taken to look for, at specific disaster areas. So for example, if there was a hurricane in an area, there was a tornado in an area, it hasn't been looked at for the whole United States. So when the president enacted this, it was for the whole United States. Again, it's a valid deduction. The only downside about trying to accelerate it, and there's been no guidance from the IRS on this, would be you don't get it in 19, you would get it in 2020. There would be no penalties or anything. But again, it's something we've advised a number of clients. It can help a number of clients. The other thing that we want to point out is, you know, it can't be a pure reduction in value. So for example, if you have a company that's invested in, an, you know, has an investment in another company and that investment went down, and it wasn't realized, that's not a valid, uh, valid deduction. You need to have actually a transaction that's taken place. So for example, I have a client, it's a woman's shoe uh, distributor. Because of COVID-19, no one was buying their shoes. They had a lot of orders canceled. They ended up selling those shoes to one of the discount shoe companies or one of the discount shoe retailers. And they sold that at a loss. Because they sold that at a loss, they were able to 
accelerate that loss and take it on the 2019 return and take a deduction for that. Next slide, please. So this is an example of some of the disaster losses that qualify for, for the 165 deduction and can be accelerated from 2020 onto your 2019 return. Closure of a store. So if you had a store that closed, you abandoned some leasehold improvements. So you did, an, you did a lot of work to your lab or, or to your facilities and as a result had to abandon the, that facility because of COVID-19. You retired some fixed assets. Again, fixed assets that you may have been using in your manufacturing or your life science process that ended up getting retired and you disposed of those. This disposal of inventory or supplies, this is something that I've seen a lot in the restaurant industry where they've had spoilage of, of food and stuff because of the fact that they were closed down. Again, that's a loss that you currently can take because you can no longer use that. Loss from a sale or exchange of property, as I mentioned, I have a client that, that uh, is a women's shoe distributor. They ended up taking a loss because of the fact all their orders got canceled in order to get rid of them. They had to sell them at a discount to a, a discount retailer. Loans on market to market securities. If you have mock to market securities that you're recognizing, again, taking that loss. If you have worthless securities and you've recognized that as being worthless because of the fact that you invested in a security, that security went out of business and you have something that you can show that that security went out of business, you can take that deduction. If you had a canceled contract or leases and you get no reimbursement for the cancellation of those contract or leases, that's another deduction that can be accelerated. If you abandon any business transaction, so you're looking at a business transaction, you, would, you incurred a number of expenses, legal expenses, accounting expenses on that business transaction, and you ended up abandoning it because of the fact of COVID-19, those losses can be uh, deducted and accelerated. And then the prepayment of events or conferences. So for example, this, this webinar, if they didn't allow it to be a webinar and you had paid for it and it was going to be you know, a regular seminar and you didn't get a refund for that, those losses can be accelerated and deducted. I think I saw somebody ask a question. Mark, did someone ask a question? Nope. No, okay. that, was, that was me asking um, the attendees if they had any questions for you. Got it, so at least I'm paying attention. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. So research and development tax credit. So in 2016, the research and development tax credit was made permanent. In addition to being made permanent, it was also able to be used, uh, it was also uh, allowed to be used against payroll taxes. And this is really important for startup biotech companies or life science companies, because generally you're doing a lot of research and development. The research and development tax credit was only allowed to be used against income taxes and startup biotech companies will not be making money for a number of years. So in 2016, Congress recognized this and said, you know what, this isn't fair to startup biotech companies who are doing a lot of good work. We should be able to get, have them get some benefit. So they allow them to take it against payroll taxes. In order to do that, you need to have current year revenue that is under $5 million. You need to have, you need to either be pre-revenue or have less revenue for the last five years than the $5 million. And is there, if you meet those requirements, you can get a credit of $250,000 a year against your payroll taxes. Again, it will offset the FICA portion of the employer tax for the 6.2%. It is available for C corporations and pass through entities, S corps and partnerships. And the payroll tax can be used in the first quarter after the filing of your return. So again, I have a number of life science companies that take advantage of this. One of the things that we here do at CIB is recognizing the fact that this could be very powerful, a way to save tax dollars. You know, we work with the company to get their taxes filed on time so that they don't have to go on extension so that they can use and maximize the, this uh, ability to use this credit against payroll taxes in that first quarter. So for example, a corporate tax return would normally be due on April 15th, we'll try to get that filed on time so that they can get the benefit in the next quarter, which would be the third quarter of their payroll tax filings. Next slide, please. In order to be eligible for the R&D credit, there's a four-part test that you need, to, you need to meet. 
So the first one is you need to have a new or improved business component. This means that you have something that's more reliable, it performs better, it's higher quality, it's an improved function. The second piece is it needs to be technological in nature. Again, it needs to be in one of the hard sciences, physical science, biological science, engineering. You know, most life science companies meet these first two components. The next component is it needs to be some level of uncertainty. So there needs to be uncertainty to if you can do what you're trying to do, or maybe you know you can do what you're trying to do, but you're not sure how you're gonna be able to do it. So you need to be able to prove uncertainty, which leads to the fourth component, which is a process of experimentation. You keep doing some iterative testing on this function that you're trying to accomplish, showing that there's uncertainty by the process of experimentation. If you meet these four tests, then you have met the requirements to have um, expenses eligible for the research and development tax credit, which if we go to the next slide, we can talk about what that means, what type of expenses are qualified. So next slide, Liz. So there are three types of expenses that, that qualify for the credit. Wages, and this means any wages of folks that have any function in the R&D program. So any wages of anyone who's directly involved in R&D or supervises the R&D function, their wages or the percentage of their time that they're spent in the R&D function will qualify for uh, uh, qualifying expenses for the credit. One thing I do want to point out, if you have someone who spends 80% of their time in R&D and let's say 20% of their time, you know, in some other function, the code allows anyone who spends at least 80% of their time, if you spend 80% of your time, then we can take 100% of your wages. So when we're doing this for our biotechs and our life science clients, we're always looking to see if we can get someone to that 80% limit because then we can, or that 80% level, so then we can take 100% of their wages. The next thing that of qualifying expenses is supplies. Any supply that is used or consumed in the R&D process can be considered to be qualifying expenses eligible for the credit. And then if you're using any outside research firm, 65% of the cost related to the outside research firm that you're using or the outside consulting you're using are eligible for the credit. Next slide. So the Massachusetts Security Corp, as I mentioned when I went through the agenda, Massachusetts taxes companies two ways. It taxes them on their income at 8%. It also taxes companies on their balance sheet. So for a life science company that just got a bunch of funding from either a private equity firm, an investment capital firm, or maybe you know an IPO, they're not aware of the fact that you also get taxed on your balance sheet. And there's a calculation that's done, it's a snapshot of time at the end of the year, whereby you take a look at what your balance sheet looks like. Mm -hmm. And if you're considered to be a net worth company, then you will get taxed on your net worth. And I've seen a number of life science companies get hit with this and not be prepared for it. So we'll work with our clients in order to come up with the calculation work with them to see what their burn's mm -hmm. gonna be so that we can project whether or not they're gonna be in a situation where they're gonna have a significant net worth tax at the end of the year. And then one of the things that we work with them on is setting up a mass security club. And the reason that you wanna set up a mass security club is because of the fact that the mass security club, number one, is not subject to the net worth tax. So what you do is you form a subsidiary qualify it to be considered a Massachusetts Security Corp by the Massachusetts uh, Department of Revenue. So there's a number of filings that need to be done. What that will do is that will reduce your net worth tax at the parent company. It will also put the cash down at the, at the Mass Security Corp level where you don't have this net worth tax. Now, the, the downside of having the money at the Mass Security Corp level is if any interest in dividends that that company earns will be subject to tax and you won't be able to use the losses generated at the parent company from the state perspective. However, because of that, the Massachusetts uh, Security Corp is taxed at a very favorable rate of 1.32% as opposed to the normal income tax rate of 8%. So thereby, you're saving yourself a significant amount of net worth tax and you're paying tax at a much lower rate on your investment income. From a federal perspective, it's gonna be filed as part of the consolidated return 
and there will be no additional taxes. But again, it's a very powerful tool that can be used if planned co accordingly to reduce this net worth tax that a lot of companies are not aware of. Uh, not aware of. Next slide. So again, just wanted to provide you with some cash savings opportunities from a tax perspective um, that we have you know, mentioned to a number of our clients, consulted with a number of our clients and have worked with getting implemented so that they can get some real cash dollars uh, in their pockets today and save some tax dollars. Not sure if there are any questions for anybody at this time from a tax perspective. I think there's a question for Dave. So Dave, if you'd like to take that question. Sure. There was a question around <clears throat> how do we handle payments made to overseas CROs? So that's a good question. And I'll answer it. And if I'm not hitting exactly what you want, please just, uh, just keep asking. So in essence, from a process perspective, you're going to make the payment just like you pay any, any other vendor. You get the invoice, you'll approve the invoice, and uh, you'll make the payment. I think a couple of things. If they're in invoicing you in a foreign currency, just be aware of, of, um, you know, of the exchange rates, so on and so forth. But this is a good example of where if you have an overseas vendor, you want to make sure before you make any payments that you've received a W-8 Ben E from them. And essentially what that form will indicate is whether you, the payor, need to withhold any withholding taxes or whether, um, or whether you don't. So, and, and usually when you do the W-8 Benny, it allows you to not withhold any withholding taxes and the payee, the, the CRO, will be responsible for any taxes. But if you don't have that form, and let's say the invoice was for $10,000 and you paid the $10,000, but you were supposed to withhold some type of U.S. withholding tax and you didn't, you're on the hook for it, not the vendor. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. That's a quite detailed explanation. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we just want to take this opportunity to say uh, to our audience, if you would like to take yourselves off mute, you can do so. Just raise your hands and we'll give you the, uh, the talking permissions. You know, oftentimes uh, I go through these presentations, we've seen about 200 of them at this point. And uh, when sometimes you don't have too many questions, it's actually a good sign as well. So there is one more question that came through. So it says, do we have to send the W-8 Ben to the overseas vendor? So, so the short answer is yes, they're the ones that will fill it out. So Larger CROs who've done this 20, you know, a million times, they'll know exactly what to do. They'll be very familiar with the form. And then if you're working with, let's say, just a smaller vendor, they may, there's a possibility they may never have done one of these before and they may need some handholding. So Mike and I have partnered together to help our clients, A, get the right form to send over and then we, we review it when it comes back to make sure that it's, um, it's completed correctly. Yeah, and as Dave said, we've done this a number of times, and Dave and I were just working with a client that was going through an IPO, and as part of the due diligence process, one of the questions that came up is, you know, were there any outstanding withholding taxes? And because the client was able to prove that they had, some, you know, they had signed WA Bennies from all of their overseas vendors, it allowed all the investment bankers to get comfortable with the fact that there was no exposure because that could be a real significant tax um as you're going public it's not something that you want to have hanging over your head and it's funny mike i remember way back it was one of the very first things we did with this particular client when we first got hired exactly oops that's me sorry any other questions uh, i do have a question um are these slides available for all of the folks that participated today? Um, I'm happy to share them. Uh, Sean and Claudia, I don't know what's the um, best way to do that, but I'm happy to, to send them out. Um, you can share those with me. And if there's anybody in here that would like uh, the presentation here, just uh, email info at vencaf.org and we'll share those out with you. 
and I'll drop that into the chat box here as well. Info at vencath.org. And there is a high likelihood that we will be uh, sharing this presentation mm -hmm. on our YouTube channel as well. So if there was anything that you missed, you can definitely go back to take a look. Nice. Well, that also brings us to the top of the hour. I would very much like to thank Michael and Dave for sharing their knowledge here. Um, uh, CBiz is not only uh, our partner in terms of accounting, but they are, are an annual sponsor of ours, and I can see that we're in good hands. So I want to thank both Dave and Michael uh, for volunteering their time today and being here with us. Uh, today is our annual Bio Connect. If you would like to be directed back to the homepage to see the rest of the evening's agenda, you can go to www.vencaf.org forward slash sign in. Otherwise, it's been great to see you all, and we'll see you around soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Nice, nice meeting you virtually. Likewise. Thank you so much.